Hello everyone, my name is Rose Daniel and I'm the Technical Manager with APAL. Welcome to the second online session of the Pair Masterclass. Last week in session one, we heard about commonly used planting systems and the latest developments in rootstocks. If you missed the first session, you can find a recording of it in the Future Orchards Library on the APAL website. The third and final session will run next Wednesday at this time and we will discuss the tools to optimise fertilisation and opt options for winter fertilisation fertigation and foliar fertilization. Okay, today's session will explore the new varieties that have been introduced in Europe and Australia, discussing the different growing experiences and the successes and challenges of these varieties. You will hear from Dirk van Hees, a tree management and fertilization consultant with Fruit Consult in the Netherlands. Dirk will share with us the new varieties that have been planted at the experimental farm Proftian Rampik and how they might perform in our growing conditions. Dirk's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session where our panel will provide a local perspective on pear varieties and answer your questions. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dirk. Dirk Van Hees is a tree management and fertilization consultant with Fruit Consult. His family have been growing for more than four generations, which, leads, sorry, which led Dirk to study horticulture and arable farming. During his study, he commenced and undertook four traineeships, one with fruit consult and three with different fruit growers in Victoria, Australia. Dirk's clients are predominantly based in Holland, the Czech Republic and Denmark, and in 2018 expanded to include projects in China. Since 2013, Dirk has been involved in the redevelopment of the experimental farm Pofchen Randvik, conducting a range of field research projects and trials. Dirk, it is now my pleasure to hand over to you. We start with the current situation in Holland. Uh, in Holland, we have a little bit more than 10,000 hectares of pears uh, at the moment. 75% uh, of all pears are conference pears, so that's our main variety, our most important variety. Second one is Dwayne de Comis. 7% is Dwayne de Comis. 6% is Burre Alexander Lucas. Now, if we look at the 10,000 hectares, then 9% of these 10,000 hectares, around 800, 900 hectares, are already new varieties in Holland, and 4% are still really old varieties. Now, we have three big new varieties. One of them is Migo. Around 250 hectares is planted with Migo in the last five years. Uh, in the last 10 years, 250 hectares is planted with Xenia. Also, the last 10 years, 250 hectares is planted with Sweet Sensation. And around 50 hectares, the last three, four years, is planted with Early Desire, a new red blush variety. Now, Proeftuin Randwijk is very important for us. Uh, we, as Fruit Consult, we are a partner in Proeftuin Randwijk. And in Proeftuin Randwijk, we try to show all the new varieties to the growers. So we demonstrate the uh, traditional varieties, Conference, Dwayne de Comis and Burre Alexander Lucas in different planting systems on Proeftuin Randwijk. But we also demonstrate the new uh, red blushed varieties. And we have now in the Proeftuin, we have nine new red blushed varieties. Early Desire, Honeybell, Cutie, Red, Ang red Angel, Red Conference, uh, Red Modoc, Regal Red. Sweet Sensation and Timo, and two new green varieties, Migo and Xenia. And on Proeftuin Randwijk, we like to demonstrate these varieties to the growers in different planting systems or with different small trials. Now, besides that, we also search always for new varieties. And Wageningen University is doing that uh, together uh, with uh, 17 other partners, mainly nurseries, sales companies and consultants. And together we are always looking for new varieties. Now, why a new pear variety in Holland? And that, that, that's important uh, to know a little bit the situation. Is we see the last 10 years that the traditional apple varieties, Elstar and Jonagold, they do not bring enough return to the grower anymore. Uh, the European market for apples is almost full. 
And for us, for Holland, it's really difficult to compete with Eastern Europe and South Europe. Uh, Holland is the north part of Europe. The north part of Europe has not uh, enough light or has less light compared to Italy. So productions uh, in Italy are much higher compared to, the, to compared to Holland. So it's really difficult for us to compete in apples. However, for, apple, for pears, we have a really good uh, suitable climate with a lot of water available. What we also see is uh, there is a market for red blushed pears in Europe, especially in the UK, in Germany, and in the northern part in the Scandinavian countries. And there is also a market for smooth pears. And the market for smooth pears is more in the Middle East and in Asia. So we started to export pears to China around three, four years ago. And there is market for pears with a better shelf life or with a good shelf life. Also, especially in the Middle East and in Asia. Now, in conferences, it's our biggest pear variety. And it will also stay the biggest pear variety because uh, it's behaving very well. However, it also has some disadvantages. And uh, two things are, one, one, one thing is in particular extremely important, and that's the demand of labor in conference uh, pairs. Uh, conference, to get good quality, you need to pick it all in two weeks. So the first two weeks of September, uh, at the moment, they are picking the last uh, conference pairs. And we see if you go to only conference pairs, the pickers uh, are normally coming from Eastern Europe, from Poland, from Romania, from um, Bulgaria, Ukraine, and they don't want to come just for two weeks to Holland to pick the conference pass. So we need at least a picking window of four weeks. So it's very important to have more varieties than only conference. Now, what makes uh, a variety a new? a winner that that's very important that is always to keep in mind um, it first always starts with a high price high price is always the most important one second one is high production you can have a high price but when the production is really low it can be just an average variety so high production also very important high pack out a little bit the same when you have a really high productions but when the pack out is just 40 to 50 uh, percent then also the variety is, uh, is difficult because uh, yeah, we see more and more than with new varieties, especially with second class uh, pairs, there is no market anymore for it. They only want to have the top quality uh, and the second class is getting more and more difficult to sell them. And the last uh, important issue with new varieties is always the demand of labor. Is it a variety that uh, needs a lot of labor, uh, hand thinning, pruning, uh, picking, or is it a variety that is easily easy to manage? Uh, not a lot of labor, big pairs, low picking costs, uh, not no hand thinning, these kind of things. When you combine all these things, that makes a new variety a winner or a loser. So that's always important to keep in mind. Now, then we go to the varieties I want to discuss today. Well, it's a lot. I can, I can talk, uh, let's say, two hours about it. But that's, yeah, we are not going to do that, of course. But I want to discuss the five uh, recently introduced varieties a little bit uh, longer. Cutie, Early Desire, Migo, Sweet Sensation, and Xenia. And the other five, vari five varieties we just have uh, in test trials in the research station and in small orchards, uh, that's, I just want to show do, you, you them and maybe we can later uh, in the Q&A part, we can discuss a little bit longer about these new uh, test varieties. But I focus the most on the five recently introduced uh, varieties. We start with uh, the first one, that's the Cutie, or Selina is the brand uh, name. Uh, Cutie is a red blushed variety with a really nice appearance. It's a, quite a small variety. The size is not really big, it's 60 to 70 millimeters. Um, storability is about five to six uh, months. 
and uh, that's also the sales uh, period in Holland. So uh, they sell it especially to the uh, UK market starting half of August till around Christmas. Worldwide there's planted quite, already, uh, quite a lot of uh, Selena already, especially in uh, South Africa, around 500 hectares and 125 hectares is planted in Belgium. The owner, um, Fruithandel Wouters, they didn't want to uh, plant uh, Selina in Holland. Uh, maybe in the future, maybe in one or two years, it's also coming in Holland. But he decided for now that he only uh, left it in Belgium and did not give a license for Holland yet. Now, Selina is always flowering heavy with cluster leaves, with nice quality cluster leaves, one, two days before conference. And conference is also a good pollinator for Selina. Now, here's some examples of uh, Selina. This is the flowering fruit set after June drop and uh, with picking. Now, hand thinning is a very important issue in Selina. So, hand thinning is always necessary because it gives easily too much pears. And when the pears, uh, when there are too much pears on the, on the tree, then the pears will stay too small. And also in Belgium, we have a problem with too less uh, content of sugar inside the pear when there are too much pears per tree. An advantage is, is that the production is really high already from the beginning. So already in the second year, you can pick already, let's say, when you plant a good quality tree, you can pick already between five and eight kilograms in the second year. So production is absolutely not an issue. Probably it's the best, most productive new variety um, when you uh, talk about the number of pairs per tree. 50 to 55 tons is a realistic uh, production per hectare for a full grown orchard. Now that, that's also what we see in Proeftown Randwijk. We get a, yeah, also this 50, 55 tons per hectare in the last three years. Now, advantages is a really easy tree to work with. It's productive from the beginning. It's not so sensitive for diseases. Only Pseudomonas is uh, an issue. And that's something that can happen quite easily in Holland because sometimes we get a difficult period during uh, flowering. So cold and wet, a little bit of frost. Uh, it's really uh, good weather for Pseudomonas and then it can appear quite easily in uh, QT. QT has a unique appearance, uh, unique pair to see with the nice red blush. Disadvantages, it's easily too productive, so hand thinning is really necessary. Uh, coloring can be an issue, it needs to have direct sunlight, so all the pairs that are hanging in the shade are not shiny red, and they are just red for 10-20%, but that's it. Um, and it has a short harvest period, so you harvest it really early, uh, but when you are too late with harvesting, then the shelf life is really bad. And a standard tool is to use Smart Fresh on Selena to keep the shelf life uh, nice and long. The second variety is Early Desire or Grafengepa is the variety name. Uh, it's from the eastern part of Germany. Um, it's also a red blushed pear. And for most of the things, you can compare it really good with Selena. So it's also storable for five, six months. It's also uh, sold on the same market period. So half of August till Christmas in, in Holland, um, especially to Germany, especially to the UK. Um, planted around 80 hectares at the moment, uh, 55 in Holland and 25 in Belgium. Um, so that's the second red blush variety. Growing is totally different compared to Selina. Uh, it's really early flowering, three to five days before conference, and it has almost no cluster leaves during flowering. So it's really wide flowering, like you can see on the photo. Um, pollination can be an issue, but uh, it has to be an early pollinator, like for example, Xenia. Xenia is also uh, early uh, <coughs> pollination. So, uh, yeah, that, that's really important. Now, an, an issue with uh, uh, 
Uh, Early Desire of Graf, Graf and Gepa is, uh, it gives phytotox with captan. And phytotox just after flowering uh, on the cluster leaves, and the cluster leaves are already really weak, it can give a really bad fruit set and an extra June drop. And that's what you don't want. So don't spray captan in the period around flowering till, let's say, uh, till the, the, the fruits are really like 40, 30, 40 millimeters or something. Now, some photos. Uh, fruit set is normally not a big issue. Uh, June drop can be heavy when the tree is growing too heavy, but normally when the tree is into balance, also June drop is not a big issue. This is how it looks like just before harvest. So also nice red blushed pear. And thinning is normally not necessary, only a little bit of quality thinning. Um, in the first year, you see that the production is a little bit more difficult compared to conference. But when you have all types of wood in the tree, then the production is a bit the same, like uh, the Salina, so also 50, 55 tons, is a realistic production for a full grown orchard. That's what we also see in Randwijk. In Randwijk, most of the new varieties are planted in 2015, and uh, 2018 was a little bit of full growing orchard, and now last year we see that the production is a bit stable around this 55 tons per hectare. Now, advantages of, uh, uh, of early desire, also coloring. Uh, the sales company uh, yeah, sell it as a red blushed variety. Um, so also with small blushes, uh, you will pack uh, them uh, in first class. Uh, so the pack out is really high. Uh, the taste is really good. Uh, it's one of the best tasting new varieties. Uh, for us, it's really important that you can harvest it directly before conference. So one week before conference it makes it really good uh, because then afterwards you can continue picking uh, conference with the total picking crew. It's not sensitive for diseases. We have it also in organic part of the research station and we see also no problems with scab. Uh, so yeah, absolutely no problems with, with, with diseases. Um, it has also some disadvantages and especially the, the blind tooth is, is an issue. Um, we solved it a little bit with uh, the pruning method, but the blind tooth is always something to uh, take care of. Um, and we saw in 2016, we had a really warm winter and that was quite a disaster. Trees were really young in, uh, at that moment uh, at the growers. And we saw that the flowering started already yeah, February, March, the first flowers came out. Also some psylla was involved, but um, we saw quite a few problems in uh, uh, that, that this variety does need that much winter rest. Now, like I said before, captan is phytotoxic with this variety, is so something to take care of. And it's again a short uh, period of harvest. So shelf life, uh, yeah, need to be picked in a short period because otherwise shelf life is, a, is an issue. And this variety is also standard treated with smart fresh. Then the third variety I want to talk about is uh, Migo. Migo is a club variety from uh, Fruit Masters in Holland, a big cooperation in Holland. Its origin is from France, a crossing of Conference and Doyenne Diver. It's a smooth and green pear, uh, quite a big pear for fruit sizes a bit bigger than Conference, so 65 to 85 millimeters. Uh, storability is a little bit an issue. Uh, we think it can be storable till uh, June, so around nine to 10 months. However, it's still an investigation because especially the last two years, we had some problems with uh, internal browning. And we are really, at the moment, uh, Fruit Masters is really optimizing the storage regime. It, it's something totally different compared to other pairs. So that's something uh, that need to take care of because otherwise it yeah, can damage the pair too much. Um, However, yeah, I think it can, it will be solved uh, in the following five years, but it's still a little bit an issue. Worldwide has planted around 325 hectares of Migo uh, last year, and in Holland the last five years has planted around 250 hectares. 
it needs a little bit of storage to get a good taste. Taste is quite an issue in Migo, I have to say. Now, Migo is flowering normally quite heavy with good quality cluster leaves, with the same time uh, as conference. And in the beginning, you see it's more like a commis type uh, and not a conference type. So in the beginning, when you have uh, just not filled up the volume, not all types of wood in the tree, it's also sensitive for biennial bearing. But when you have all types of wood in the tree, it's a bit the same like commis, then the biennial bearing is also disappearing a little bit. But it can be an issue in the first three, four years. Pollination. Uh, uh, conference is a good pollinator for Migo. Now here's some photos of the flowering, photos of the fruit set. Fruit set normally is not an issue. June drop can be an issue. This is how it looks like just before picking, also just before picking. And if you look at these trees, there's not a lot of, a lot of growth in it. And that's very important because uh, when the growing level is the same level compared to conference, and in conference we like growth, we need growth to get big, good quality conference pairs. But when you have the same uh, growth in MIGO, then the June drop is always disappointing. Then the June drop is always too heavy. So the tree needs to be in balance. The growth cannot be uh, too high. So the growing level should be definitely 10 to 20% lower compared to conference pairs. But the same like commis pairs. Also the skin is really smooth and that means that the skin is also a bit sensitive for russeting, um, especially wind damage, uh, mildew, uh, when pairs hang together it can damage the skin quite easily. So that, that's an issue with, with Migo. However the skin, the appearance is really nice and really smooth. Smoother, much smoother than conference, totally different compared to conference. Now, hand thinning is normally not necessary in uh, Migo, sometimes a little bit of quality thinning. Um, in the first years, yeah, it's more difficult to produce Migo uh, compared to conference because you want to grow, you make, you will, to, you want to fill up the volume of the, the orchard to get early into production. However, uh, when the growing level is too high, um, then uh, the production is too low. So you need to fill up the volume a little bit uh, in, in a longer period compared to conference. Otherwise, you do not get the early productions. When the volume is uh, totally filled and when the tree is totally into balance, then we see the production of 50 to 60 tons is absolutely not a problem. Uh, productions are uh, when the uh, yeah when the, the the tree is totally filled up the volume, then the productions are a bit the same like conference pairs. Now that's also what happened in the Proeftuin Randwijk. We saw in 2018 there was not a good balance in the tree, too much growth, and a disappointing harvest. However, we reduced the growth with heavy root pruning, even double side root pruning in the winter uh, in, of uh, 2019. And uh, after that, the trees are more into balance. And now we see the productions uh, above 60 tons, which is really nice. Now the advantages of Migo is the skin quality. It looks different compared to conference and it looks also really nice. It's a really good looking pair, good looking green pair. The hand thinning is really limited. And because the size is quite big, also, the picking results are uh, really good. It picks really easy, uh, really high uh, kilograms per hour per picker. So that, that's good. Um, now, disadvantages is skin damages. That, that, that's really a disadvantage. Harvest period, uh, it looks like it is in the first week of conference pairs, which is for us quite a problem because in this period, it's already so busy at many companies in Holland. So that, that's a difficulty. Um, taste is not so special. It's a little bit of, not a lot of moisture in it. it the self life is extremely good. However, the taste is not so special. And yeah, the still under investigation is the internal browning in storage. And that's something that needs to be solved. And I think it will be solved in the following years. Also with, 
with different water strategies in the orchard. Uh, and these kind of things, we're testing a lot of things at the moment. And I think in two or three years, this, this problem will be solved. But for now, it's still uh, a problem. Then the next variety is Sweet Sensation. Sweet Sensation is a red mutation of Dwayne de Comis. Um, yeah, storability is a bit the same like Comis, so also six, seven months. In worldwide, it's planted around 500 hectares. 250 hectares uh, is planted in, in Holland. And the sale season in Holland is from October, starting in October till uh, March. Now, flowering is always good with cluster leaves around two, two three days later uh, than conference. Sweet sensation is also commis type, so also sensitive for biennial bearing, uh, especially in the first five years. And we see that it's more sensitive than commis because it has uh, a little bit the red uh, cluster leaves, the red glow in the cluster leaves. Because you can see it already in the flowers and you can see it in the cluster leaves, uh, will give less uh, photosynthesis. And um, yeah, that, that's, that can be a little bit of a problem. Pollination uh, is, is conference. So the, for the rest, it's a bit the same like commis pairs. Now, photo of uh, the flowering, photo of uh, the fruit set. June drop is always heavy in uh, sweet sensation, always just one pair per cluster. And a photo just before harvest. Now hand thinning is never necessary, production is, is an issue. First five years production is difficult, but after five years, uh, stable production of around 35 to 45 tons is a bit realistic. So it's not a high uh, productive variety. When you compare it with commis, commis is, uh, the production of commis will always be higher. And that's because, uh, yeah, that's a little bit what I explained already, is uh, because we have uh, this red blush in the leaves. Now the taste is absolute excellent. I think it's the best tasting pair uh, on the market. The demand of labor is quite low. Um, Picking time is quite ideal. Uh, picking time is directly after conference, so that makes it also uh, ideal for the Dutch growers. Pack out is quite an issue. Uh, the sales company Greenery sells a lot to the UK and the UK is quite strict on color and then pack out can be uh, a bit of an issue. We also sell uh, sweet sensation to the German market and they sell it more as a red blush uh, variety. And there we see, see that the coloration is much easier. So it's also depending a little bit on the sales company and the sales strategy. Uh, skin damage is a bit the same like a commis pair, so also quite uh, difficult. Also sensitive for skin damage, same like commis. Now pro productivity is an issue, the especially the first five years. And the productivity is definitely lower compared to Dwayne de commis. Okay, then the last variety I want to talk about is also a really interesting one. That's uh, Xenia. Xenia is a club variety from uh, the Xenia club, uh, Xenia Europe. Uh, origin is from Moldavia. It's a green pear. Uh, sometimes with a little bit of a bronze uh, tint on it, uh, same like Conference, but it's a bit smoother than Conference, but not, not as smooth as Amigo, for example. It's a big pear. Big size, 65 to 85 millimeters. Uh, storability is really good till uh, June, July. Uh, Europe is planted now around 450 hectares of Xenia the last uh, 10, 15 years. And in Holland is planted around 250 hectares of uh, Xenia. Uh, the sale season is December till May. Uh, for a good taste, it needs a little bit of storage. But after storage, the taste is, is, is really good. However, 
the taste from the tree is not so good. It needs a little bit of storage before you get a nice taste. Very important with Xenia pears is that uh, is, is the choice of rootstock. Uh, Migo needs a lower uh, growing level compared to conference. Xenia needs a higher growing level compared to conference. So quince MA directly without interstem is okay. Quince C with interstem is a good growing level. Quince C directly is absolutely not possible. A lot of problems with it. Uh, quince Adams with interstem is the best and it's mostly planted the last uh, five years in Holland. So quince A for uh, Australia, for example, even quince A with interstem would be the best combination for Australia, in my opinion. Now, Xenia is also flowering very early, very heavy, with not a lot of cluster leaves. Um, however, uh, biennial bearing is absolutely not an issue. And early is really like seven days before conference. In that period, pollination is always a little bit of an issue. So uh, pollination is done mainly by uh, the ornamental pair, uh, Polinia 1 or Polinia 2, and done uh, in practice a lot with Graf and Gepa. And that works really sufficient. Now the flowering of Xenia on this photo. Fruit set of Xenia after June drop and uh, just before picking. Now hand thinning is not a big problem in Xenia. Sometimes let's say one in five years, it can be a problem. Um, However, uh, it's quite difficult to hand in it. You need scissors to do it because it's really difficult uh, to hand in hand tin uh, the Xenia by hand. Uh, so you need scissors to do it. However, it's almost uh, not necessary. In the first years, the production is a little bit depend, dep depending on the flowering weather. Uh, we can get uh, yeah, a little bit of difficult weather, end of March, beginning of April in Holland. Uh, wet, they don't like wet during a flowering period, so pseudomonas can appear quite easily. Um, and that's especially in young orchids that can be a little bit of a problem. Uh, when the weather is good, production is also good, the weather during flowering. For a full grown orchid, uh, this is the, let's say, uh, a really high productive variety. So productions are extremely high, 80 to 100 tons is absolutely not a problem for a full grown orchid. Also in Proeftuin Randwijk, the last, uh, yeah, let's say the last bad production was 2012 and afterwards it, it was all between 80 and, and 100 tons per hectare every year. So really high productions, productions in Xenia. Now advantages of Xenia is, uh, is the taste after storage. It's typical uh, taste, but a good taste. Self life is a really uh, good thing about Xenia. High production is, is really uh, a good thing about Xenia. And because the, the pear is quite big, also the picking results are uh, yeah, quite good. So you can pick a lot of kilograms per hour per picker. Disadvantage is, is uh, the early and the white flowering. And because of this early and white flowering, also the sensibility for Pseudomonas. Uh, it's quite sensitive for Pseudomonas. Uh, that's def definitely an, an issue. Uh, and in the beginning, uh, let's say 10 years ago, it's planted too much without interstem. So uh, if you choose for Xenia, you need to plant on interstem. And that's for the club, as a club, the Xenia Europe club, uh, that's a an, an disadvantage because these uh, orchids are not stable. Uh, these were the recent introduced varieties. Now I just want to show you uh, the varieties we have in uh, the research station, but I'm not going to talk too much about it because um, I'm already talking a little bit too long, I think. Belle de Jumet, we have on the research station. It's a really early variety, interesting variety, but yeah, very early. Rigo Red is a uh, bit the same uh, red mutation of Comis. However, 
darker red compared to sweet sensation is also quite interesting. We have red angel from the USA. Um, yeah, it's getting also a club variety in Belgium uh, since this year. Uh, we have it now in the research station. We have also red modok, uh, and that's a bit of the brother of red angel. Uh, it's Lori too, also from the USA. Also a club variety in Belgium right now, just since uh, last year. And we have red conference since last year. It's a mutation of, of conference pairs. It's a red conference pairs, which is also very interesting for the Dutch growers. Now to summarize it a little bit, the flowering period, we have two really early flowering varieties, early desire and Xenia. Then most of the varieties are middle uh, period of flowering and two varieties are late flowering and that's sweet sensation and the legal red. Harvest period, and that's also interesting. QT and Honeybell are harvested uh, the earliest, uh, already in the second week of August. Early desire is uh, one week before conference. Then we have the conference period, the very busy period in Holland. We pick the MIGO in the first week of conference and the RED conference in the second week of the conference. Sweet sensation, legal RED, directly after conference. And Xenia, uh, there's always seven to ten days between Xenia, RED Angel and RED Modoc and conference. So these varieties we harvested quite late. Also interesting is the production uh, potential. And then you see Sweet Sensation, Regal Red, we are struggling with the productions a little bit. So the price and the, the taste and everything, that, that needs to make it a success, I would say. Uh, productions are 40 to 45 tons uh, for the good uh, growers who do everything uh, perfectly. Uh, most varieties are a bit, yeah, just a little bit less, let's say five to 10 tons less uh, compared to conference. Migo is a bit on the same level to conference and Xenia is the most productive variety, uh, new variety we have at the moment. Uh, it's quite easy to grow uh, more than 80 tons per hectare in Xenia pairs. Okay, again back uh, to the beginning. What makes uh, a new variety a winner? So we talk about price, production, pack out and demand of labor. Now, if I need to choose in Holland and Belgium, then early desire uh, is for me a, a really good variety because production is a bit the same like conference, a little bit lower than conference and you pick it directly before conference. And we see in the last years, the prices are really good of early desire. Xenia is also absolutely the winner because prices are comparable to a little bit higher even compared to conference and um, production is definitely higher compared to conference. So a lot of um, advantages on, on the Xenia uh, in Holland. So Xenia is definitely a winner. The other two that are uh, also quite good, uh, growers are quite enthusiastic about it is Migo and QT. QT in Belgium, uh, Migo in Holland. Um, yeah, definitely uh, varieties to look at um, and uh, even uh, some growers with sweet sensation who have also positive results with sweet sensation but it's not because of production but it's absolutely because of price because of appearance and because of taste these are the uh, yeah the really good things about sweet sensation production is really a struggle production pack and pack out that 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 that, that makes sweet sensation difficult and only the top quality growers, uh, they make really good money on sweet sensation. But if you are just an average grower, uh, don't start with sweet sensation. And of course, uh, when you choose a variety, it's always important to look at the sales company. Is it a strong sales, sales company? Is it a big marketing uh, budget available? Uh, that, that always, uh, yeah. That's always important when you choose a new variety. 
Okay, thank you for uh, watching so far. And now I want to hand over to Rose again. Thanks very much, Dirk. And I'd now like to invite the panel members to join us on screen for an interactive Q and A. Um, Marcel Veens, an Australian-based fruit production advisor who supports growers with sound practical advice on all aspects of orchard management. Mick Crisera from Fruit Growers Victoria, assists Victorian apple and pear and stone fruit growers with all IPDM and fruit production best practice. Andrew Mandemaker from APAL, who is responsible for commercialising pear varieties Rico and Lanya and expanding the plantings of these varieties globally. Andrew Morn is responsible for IP commercialization with the Fresh Max Group based in the Goulburn Valley in Victoria, across the poem fruit, stone fruit, citrus and avocado categories. And Matthew Lenny from Kalimna Orchard, a third generation grower who is passionate about growing pears and enjoys being innovative. So please take this opportunity to ask Dirk and the panel members any questions you have on the new varieties of pears being growing, grown here in Australia and in Europe. As mentioned earlier, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function or raise your hand and you can join us on camera. To access both of these options, go to the bottom of your screen and you'll see the appropriate tabs to click on. Okay, I'm going to hand over to you, Andrew Mandemaker, um, to lead the discussion. Uh, thank you, Rose. Um, and thanks, Dirk. That was actually really interesting and getting uh, quite deep into some of those um, uh, varieties. Um, we've got one question uh, off the bat, which is good, um, asking, for a comment on, on Timo. Um, I think there's some problems with that one. I was wondering if you could have a comment on that. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we have Timo also in the research station uh, around 10 trees. And Timo was introduced in Holland around 10 years ago. However, it was not a big success, I have to say. Some growers started with it 10 years ago, but um, they did not continue with Timo. And the main reason, or there were basically two reasons. And the first reason was uh, production. Production is quite difficult on Timo. And the second reason, and that's probably the main reason, is uh, the scab in the store, of uh, the scab, not the scab, the, uh, the scald in storability. Uh, so we had some scald issues in, 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 in the storage. And that was the main issue that we did not continue with Timo in Holland. Uh, that is one big uh, Belgium sales company uh, who still have around yeah, something between five and ten hectares of uh, Timo but um, yeah uh, so he, he continues with it and he will uh, keep his orchard but he will not really uh, plant a lot of more hectares of uh, Timo I think. Thanks Dirk. Um, since I'm the moderator I get to get a free question. Um, this one's actually to, to Andrew Mortar, if it's all right. Um, and in Dirk's presentation, two of the four pears you recommend at the end were green pears, so pears without a blush, without color. Um, for me, the, is, there, is there a market, I think, from the other end, not from the grower end, but from the market end? Is there a market in Australia for, for green pears? Are, are we saturated that market, and is that uh, not going to work for us? Oh, look, I mean, the Australian market is still, domestic market is still dominated by green pears. Um, and it's uh, most people, associate, most consumers associate pears as being green skin. Um, the red blush or red pears is becoming um, more popular in, in a lot of categories, and, and as in a lot of other categories with high colour or, or red blush, um, particularly for export markets. Uh, I guess with a green pear, potentially something that there's, that can be eaten firm and crunchy off the tree or a type of scenario or, or a, a firmer eating pear like eaten like an apple is potential there. And um, if there's something that can give uh, better production than what we're currently getting out of the current green pears or um, other agronomic advantages, there's potential there. But I guess from my perspective, it's been more along the, the red plush or red pears is probably where we've seen the most potential in, in recent times, given the dominance of Packham and and William pears in our market. Yeah, that's so that's that's how I see it as well. That it's it's about differentiation away from the um, the standard pears and trying to produce a pear that's better, but in, the, in a way, um, just another green pear. I, I think they really struggled to get some differentiation against uh, uh, Packhams and Williams. Um, thanks for that uh, one. Um, question from uh, from our good friend uh, Tom Frank. Um, 
what are your recommendations around preferred root stocks combinations for Graffin Grippa, Selena, and Sweet Sensation? I think that's you, Jack. Um, yeah, especially Graf and Gepa, uh definitely need an, uh, an interstem. Um, but normally it's a quite good growing uh, tree. So if you, in Holland, we use it on the Quint C with interstem uh, Brehadi Bre or Comis, and that functions quite good. Uh, for Australia, when water is more an issue, probably you should try it on uh, uh, Quince Adams or even Quince A. Um, Selina is actually the same, so also uh, preferred with an uh, interstem. Uh, also in uh, Belgium is most used as on Quince Aline and Quince Adams. Um, and the other one was Sweet Sensation. Sweet Sensation, yeah, I can go directly on Quince. Uh, Sweet Sensation is the same like Kumis. It, it, it fits very good with Quince Rootstock. Um, I would not, yeah. The issue is, and that's what I also told a little bit in the presentation, is when you have uh, Regal Red and also Sweet Sensation, mutations uh, of Sweet Sensation, of Kumis, they have always the red blush in the leaves. And the red blush in the leaves, they always need to have more difficulties with fruit set and also with growing level. So the growing level is always lower compared to Kumis. So uh, I would always suggest if Kumis grows too heavy, then uh, sweet sensation grows uh, in a good way. And you need growth to get all types of wood in the tree. Uh, too much growth is not good, but too much growth you can always handle with uh, root pruning. Uh, but uh, too less growth is a real problem. Uh, Dirk, a question for you. The interstems that you're using mostly in, in um, Holland now, uh, is it Kamis or Berhardi or what are you using for interstems typically? Yeah, both Kamis and, and Berhardi we use uh, in, 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 uh, yeah, okay. in Holland. Do you see a difference between the two at all? No, Berhardi is a little bit more slow growing compared to Kamis, okay. uh, but not a big difference, I have to say. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Um, I have a question and it's, and, and Matt Lenny, you might be able to answer this one for me. The, 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 the pairs that we're, that APAL is in charge of and, and Rico and Lenny, they they have a, uh, a focus on an export market rather than a domestic market because we have a, a saturation of pairs here. So we, we look to pull the export market. Um, in, in your choice of pairs, do you, do you, do you think that focusing on an export first uh, approach and, and choosing those varieties is, is the way forward or would you aim your uh, variety choice on a domestic market first? Uh, you know, I agree. I, I do consider uh, export being really, really important because we have a, um, generally every each year we have an oversupply of weird pairs on the market and the price of pairs uh, usually plummets and, uh, and stays quite low until May, April, May. And uh, until pack them start, and uh, and that period is really like it's a generally a difficult time to to sell pairs because the weird price is so low. So my aim, and uh, I suppose yeah, whenever I consider a new variety, I always want to make sure that one it stores long enough to be transported, to be exported, um, and it can handle you know it, it doesn't scuff too easy, and, and it can be stored for. A, for a period that it can be exported for. So, yeah, exporting uh, pears is always a consideration when choosing the variety, I think. It's very important. Yeah, no, I, I think we agree on that one, uh, Matt. Um, let me just check that question and answer the board. Um, nope. Happy to take any questions. It's uh, empty and open at the moment. Um, uh, Andrew, I've got a question for uh, go ahead. Andrew Munda. We talked about it in the, when we had the session before, was about uh, how we get it on the market, how difficult it is in Australia. You said about uh, launching a new variety. I think it's very interesting for the growers to know what happens. You were to try to get a new variety in the, on the shelf, basically, Andrew. That was my question. We talked about it, that it took four years and then you got a new buyer from Woolworths or Paul. Hey, sorry, and... sorry, you're talking about... Yes, talk to Mr. you. Andrew? Yeah, sorry. Yes, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, to Andrew. Sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah look, it is a, 
it's always a, a considerable challenge from a domestic perspective with introducing a new variety or new cultivar, whether it be um, regardless of what category it is. And um, the reality is that from the inception or the first first um, initiation of discussions around launching a new variety, it can be a number of years, it can be four, five, six, seven years. And the people within the, the seats at the retailers could change three or four times by the time you've, from when you start uh, evaluating uh, first fruit to first commercial volumes. So it is a, a very much a challenge. And, um, you know, the reality is that from uh, the two, the main retailers in Australia, that if, uh, if there is a strategic change in direction, which can happen very quickly, it can, you can be out completely within the drop of a hat as such. So it's, it's a real challenge to find, to get um, a position for, for a new variety. And just because it's a good variety doesn't mean it's got a position. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's a real challenge. And I, you know, I reiterate Matthew's comments and Andrew around export. We've seen in other categories like citrus and table grapes, where having um, an export option um, as well as a domestic farming is, is a really smart um, choice if possible. Um, and it is very hard to get something ranged and launched and it takes time. It takes a number of years to understand the nuances. And, and the other issue is that usually when you have a new variety, the first couple of years, you've got immature trees, you've got um, inconsistency in fruit quality, um, small volumes where you need to spend your most amount of money on marketing as well in those early years. So it's certainly got some challenges. No, I think it is very important for the growers to understand that, you know, once with a whole list of new peer varieties coming in, picking yeah. a winning winner, like you said, Derek, it is very important. But um, in Europe, I always say it is more driven by nursery, the peers, and then the market solved a little bit later. But in Australia, we have to solve almost the market first, and then we have to find the peer variety, more or less, you know, that's a little bit different. Absolutely. Uh, what, what we see is there is definitely a market for, for pears in, 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 in Europe. Uh, but yeah, like I said, the red blushed pears are really interesting in UK, Germany, Scandinavia. And smooth pears are really interesting for, uh, for Asia, uh, Middle East. Uh, that, that, that's how we see a little bit the market. And then there are big differences between countries because a country like the Netherlands is a bit conservative. Uh, the, when they talk about the supermarkets, they have uh, the traditional varieties and they don't want to change that much. And you see also that the com it is really difficult to come into the supermarket with a new variety. But if you come to uh, uh, our neighbors, the Germans, uh, Germany, it's much easier. Uh, the Germans, they really like something new or I don't know why, but we sell them so easy to Germany, uh, the red blushed pears, especially. Uh, it's a to total different market than, than, the, the, than the Dutch market. Um, so there is, for every market, there is something uh, special on it, I think. And you need to know the market. That's important. Um, Dirk, I've got a question as well. Sort of um, from your experience in Europe, is that, you know, for the warmer regions of Europe, is there any standout new varieties or is there any varieties in Holland that may fit, but you know, with the, with the warmer climate. Yeah, if you look at, uh, I know Xenia is planted also in the south part of Germany, also planted in, in Portugal and it's behaving quite well. So I think Xenia should suit definitely also in a warmer climate. Um, if you talk about uh, Selina, uh, Cutie, uh, we know it's planted quite a lot in South Africa from Chris Wouters and it's behaving really well in South Africa. So I believe that Selina uh, should also fit in Australia, I think. Um, and the other ones, let's say, early desire, I have no idea. Uh, when I see the results in Holland and uh, Belgium, also on lighter soils, I don't see huge problems with, with early desire. If, uh, with Graf and Gepa, so I expect, and it comes from Eastern Germany, uh, also a bit the land climate. Uh, so I don't expect big problems with, with early desire also. It's worth trying, I think. Um, uh, a sweet sensation, 
uh, it's also planted in Italy. Yeah, it, 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 it is a difficult variety. I don't think uh, that that's also the problem with commis is always we always say to grow with commis is evaporating two times more compared to confidence. So it needs a lot of water. And that's the same with sweetization, that's the same with rigorette. So it really depends on a lot of water, especially cell division phase, but also the second half of the season. When you cannot uh, deliver enough water, you get, get problems. So that can be an issue in, in Australia. Um, and with Migo, I see a little bit the same. And what I see now already, we got two really hot summers in Holland with, uh, yeah, let's say also one week with around 35 to, yeah, let's say 30, 35 degrees and some days with 38 uh, degrees. And then we see quite a lot of sunburn in Migo. However, that's basically um, without netting. So I would uh, yeah, want to see how it uh, will react on black netting, for example. However, no, nobody is putting black net netting on in, in, uh, in Holland because we have not enough, not so much light as you have. But sun, sun, sun burning is, is in MIGO quite an issue. Uh, and, and in the nurseries and also in, in practice, we see that watering is also in MIGO quite an issue. So it's probably worth trying, but uh, yeah, Sweet Sensation, Comis, uh, Regal Red and Migo, they need a lot of water. Uh, and that can be an issue in, in Australia, I think. One, one thing I have to say, Derek, uh, just with the peers in Australia, technically we got a lot of water in Shepparton. They pump more than five, five milliliters of water a year. It's normal for peer growing in Australia. And that's probably co very compatible with what you pump in Holland on the piers, you know, this technically we've got a lot of water for the piers. That's why we go to Shepparton, basically. It's very dry, but a lot of water available. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Is that correct, Michael? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we pump a lot of water on the piers, actually. Unbelievable amount. Yes. We have the water, we just have to pay for it. Yeah, you have to pay for it, right. that's it. But the in the, in the apple varieties that we're looking at, disease resistance is, is a part of that decision process around what's a good variety and whether it has resistance um, for a grower or something that makes a big difference. It, you only touched on it briefly, Jake. Is it, is it a big part of the decision-making process and the evaluation process for, uh, at, the, at the research station? Yeah, it started, let's say, um, yeah, two, three years ago. So for the, for the varieties for the future, let's say the varieties that comes uh, in, the, in the following five to 10 years, it's a big issue. But the varieties that were introduced, let's say the last five to 10 years, it was not a big issue. So it totally turned around in the research. You see it both in apples and pear research. Uh, the re research, uh, the uh, resistance against cap, for example, but, but also uh, uh, nectary has a huge problem in apples in Holland. Uh, all these kind of things. Uh, in the past, it was, let's say, uh, the number two in uh, choice of variety and also in the, in, in, you know, the whole process of, of, of getting new varieties uh, into the market. And now it uh, becomes to number one. That's, that's always number one. And then second, second is color, taste, and all, all these kind of things comes now on the second place. But now it's number one. But in the past, let's say five to ten years ago, it was number two. Um, however, you see uh, the pairs I uh, introduced today or I showed today, uh, most of them are less sensitive for uh, diseases compared to conference. And co confidence is quite difficult. Uh, if, if you grow more and more, confidence are grown in Holland uh, for, as, as organic. And yeah, confidence organic is, is absolutely not a good idea, I have to say. Uh, so is it, is it a pear scab or is it pseudomonas? What are the main, what's your main? Um, well, in, Hol in Holland, it's pear scab in confidence, in organic. Okay. Yeah, okay. Huge problem. You cannot grow without scab. You cannot grow confidence without scab. Okay organically. Mm -hmm. so I, have a, I have a question. Uh, when, when a grower chooses to grow a new variety, what, what level, level of support do they, uh, do they get from their marketing team or from, from, uh, 
consultants like yourself, how do they, um, yeah, how do they get through the first couple of years of growing a new variety when that, when the knowledge is low? Yeah, that, that's why the Proofta Randwijk is involved. We try to show all the varieties to the grower and to let it perform as optimum as possible to have that, that growers then have a look at the research station and say, okay, it's interesting or it's not interesting. However, um, yeah, you, if, if a, a variety is taken by a club, like for example, Fruit Masters or Greenery, they, yeah, you can feel that they are pushing the variety a little bit into the growers. Uh, and then it's our job as a consultant a little bit and also from the research station to show growers, okay, this is interesting or this is not interesting or these are the advantages and these are the disadvantages. Um, and then uh, the choice is of course made by the grower, but uh, we see that uh, the sales companies, they get their own varieties and they are pushing it a little bit into the market and into the growers. And our job is a little bit to show uh, the varieties uh, to the growers and to show the advantages and disadvantages. They don't hire you in more or less for the first couple of years. So, sorry, Marcel? I said so they don't hire you in for the first couple of years. Oh, they do quite a lot. Yeah, they do quite okay. a lot uh, because that, they want to make... That was probably the question what Matthew was asking. Yeah, like. they, they want to make the, uh, the variety as optimum as possible. So on the research station, but also in practice at growers, we, yeah, we do some pruning trials, some fertilization trials, fruit set trials, all these kind of things with new varieties. Uh, they try to involve us to make it as optimum as possible. And, and I think that's a good, good thing. Me too. Okay, um, it's time to wrap up now. We've been going for an hour and we want to avoid Zoom overload. So um, thank you very much, Dirk, Marcel, um, Michael, Andrew Mandemaker and Morn and Matthew for taking the time to come and join us and sharing your insights. If you've got any further questions, please follow up with the panel members directly or through us at the APAL office. And you can find today's presentation slides and videos in the Future Orchards Library on the APAL website. A recording should be available in the next few days. Thank you all out there for participating. We'll be conducting a short evaluation at the end of this session as you exit and you'll see a pop-up box directing you to an online survey. The Pear Masterclass is part of the Future Orchards program, an APAL project which is funded by Hort Innovation using the Apple and Pear industry R&D levy and contributions from the Australian government. Don't forget to register for session three of the Pear Masterclass, which will stream next Wednesday, the 16th of September at four o'clock. This session will focus on tools to optimize fertilization and what to do for winter fertilization, foliar fertilization and fertigation. You can see a summary of the next Pear Masterclass session, the spring future orchards, walks and upcoming webinars on your screen. And you can find more information about these on the APAL website under the events tab. If you have anything that you're particularly interested in, please contact us at the APAL, web, uh, APAL office. Next week, we'll also begin delivering the sp spring future orchard walks, which will focus on how to manage your orchard and adapt your work for a course in a global pandemic. The length of the walk and delivery will vary from region to region. And some regions where COVID restrictions allow, we'll be holding a hybrid face-to-face -face and online session walk. And the walks will either be held on the 17th or 18th of September, depending on whether you're on the Northern Loop or the Southern Loop. Make sure that you visit your region's event page on the APAL website or reach out to your local frontline advisor. In the meantime, stay well and we look forward to seeing you at the next sessions we're holding throughout September.